So I'm a little bit late to the party on this, but I kind of hope that a month isn't too late to be talking about a game like Bioshock Infinite. It took me a while to settle on whether I wanted to get in on this whole YouTube video analysis thing, but unemployment has left me with a void in my life that I need to fill with the attention of strangers on the internet, so I figured why the hell not and I went for it. The fact that the website hasn't had anything substantial posted to it since I finished the Halo retrospective might also have a little bit to do with it. So I'm trying something new, and I'm trying it with Bioshock. Apart from the fact that it's nice to look at, fun to play, and features some really interesting and memorable characters, Bioshock in particular is a game that grabs my attention because it wants to be something that a lot of other games in the AAA market don't. It's a game that really, really wants to be about something. Or rather, it wants to be about a lot of somethings. It doesn't just want to tell you a story and let you play around within it, but it wants to say something, and you can practically feel it strain against some of the trends in the modern gaming industry as it tries to do so. It doesn't always succeed in this venture. It's held back by a whole plethora of problems that keep it from breaking the surface quite as majestically as it could have. But it tries. As such, it's a game that you almost can't help but judge, not based solely on its own merits, but on what you feel it could or should have been. Maybe that's not fair, but it's really hard to avoid. When a game like this comes along that does so many things right and yet still has a few stumbling blocks to overcome, you almost can't help but come away from it wondering, what if? All that being said, it's still a really great game, one which I steadfastly refuse to shut up about. In this video, which, by the way, will obviously contain heavy spoilers, I'll be rambling incoherently about some of these things because I lack any kind of experience in this medium of presentation. But hey! Well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So, let's get started. Much like the original Bioshock, the main character of Bioshock Infinite is arguably the city in which it takes place. Only this time, instead of the underwater dystopia of Rapture, the city in question is Columbia, a floating city in the sky. Easily the first thing you notice about this wonder city is that it's freaking gorgeous. I mean seriously, just look at this place. While the graphics power behind the game isn't insignificant by any means, you could bump it up to Crytek levels and it probably wouldn't make that much of a difference. What makes Columbia beautiful isn't how many polygons it has, but how those polygons are used. The art design is great, and you can see how much work was put into building a city that was simultaneously fantastic and yet still period accurate. The architecture of the city boasts a harmonious mix of colonial, neoclassical, and beaux-arts. And apart from being pretty to look at, this aesthetic was very deliberately chosen, as it mirrors the architectural style used during the 1893 World's Fair, otherwise known as the Columbian Exposition. The similarities go beyond just a name reference, however. At the time, Daniel Burnham's White City in Chicago was symbolic of America as an emerging world power, trumping every World's Fair that had come before it with an unprecedented display of grandeur. Bioshock's Columbia takes all of that Gilded Age glory and combines it with the mobility of Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet, traveling from place to place, acting as a symbol of the crystallization of American ideals. A technologically adept, morally guided super-icon of Manifest Destiny, claiming not just the land, but now the skies. It's essentially a concerted effort to say, look how cool we are. And when you have an entire metropolis held aloft by quantum particle physics, well, it's kind of hard to argue that point. I must have spent two hours just walking around the opening area of the game, a place that in reality need only take a few minutes, just looking at stuff. It's a veritable eye feast, and you really need to slow down to take it all in. Plus, there's a lot of interesting foreshadowing going on during this time, and while it's easy to miss the first time around, coming back again imbues just about everything with new weight and meaning. And one of the things that I was most excited about, both in watching trailers and in actually picking up the game for the first time, was the fact that the city actually feels alive. When you get there, there's people hanging around, talking to each other, doing things. The idea of navigating a city where not everyone is constantly trying to kill you was very appealing, and at first it seemed like it was going to follow through on that idea. 
But over time, that facade really starts to break down, as the game reveals that these citizens aren't really anything more than window dressing. You want to know the most surefire way to anticipate an ambush? If the streets suddenly empty like Pyongyang after curfew. I get that the game didn't want to risk its players accidentally gunning down kids in the street and possibly earning it an AO rating in the process, but this just felt kind of cheap. They could have added an invulnerability exception to non-aggressive NPCs and had them run for cover inside storefronts or behind walls or something. But instead, in a place that not a moment before might have been bustling with activity, everyone's mysteriously vanished in some kind of localized rapture event. I mean, isn't this Columbia, majestic city, home to thousands? Not Columbia Land, the pretty-looking theme park where all the staff are trying to kill you? No? Okay, I guess not, then. Oh well, I mean, at least it looks good, and actually resembles something that people could plausibly live in or use. I mean, I'll take slightly underpopulated but beautifully designed city over a grey-tinted industrial corridor with no possible practical application number 256 any day. Bioshock Infinite is a strange beast. The Shock series, though it can only tentatively be called that, has steadily degraded its inventory, skill allocation, and character specialization and planning in every iteration since System Shock 2. At this point in the franchise, there's really not a lot left of the old depth. Instead, it's just a shooter with a better than average setting and story. What little inventory management remains has now actually been rendered decidedly obtuse and unintuitive. Healing items and such are still present, but you can't actually carry any of them with you as you could in past games. This means that if you need to patch yourself up really quick, you need to stop, disengage, and scour around the environment looking for a corpse or a garbage can that hopefully has some chips stashed away in it so you can eat yourself back to health. Now, I don't have a problem with the old look at stuff to loot at school of environment interaction. God knows, I've spent days doing it in the Elder Scrolls, but then the Elder Scrolls let me carry it. Now, the problem is that this is a system for a slower, more deliberate game. It's not meant for you to interact with quickly, and everything in Bioshock Infinite happens quickly. It's a carryover from the series' older playstyle, but when the game doesn't play like that anymore, then it feels really awkward and out of place. Further complicating matters is the fact that if you're playing on a gamepad, the button to loot stuff is mapped to the same button you use to reload. This makes for a lot of incredibly irritating firefights when you're trying to slap in a new mag, but instead end up searching a dead guy's pockets for spare change. There is, however, a reason for all this. The developers decided to remove your ability to carry health packs and the like not just to get on your nerves, but to make use of Elizabeth during combat. While she doesn't fight herself, she will help you out in any way she can, mostly by tossing you ammunition and, yes, health kits during a fight whenever you start to run low. This has definitely saved my ass more than a few times, and it's actually a great way to further connect the player to Elizabeth's character. She's helping you out with much-needed supplies during combat, making her consistently useful throughout all parts of the game. It's a nice touch, but it's somewhat undermined by the fact that they had to deliberately remove other elements in order to make it work, and removing those elements robs the player of a lot of their agency. There has been at least one upgrade to the inventory system, however, and that's the weapon selection. The number of guns you have available to you in this game is nearly quadrupled, yet I can't for the life of me figure out why. See, despite upping the total number of firearms, they've gone for the two-weapon carry limit route for Infinite. So despite having a ton of guns to choose from, you can only ever make immediate use of two of them. See, in Bioshock, you could carry all of the weapons that you found, and you could make use of all of them for very specific tasks. You had the pistol for smaller, weaker enemies, the shotgun when you were in tight spaces, the rocket launcher for the oh crap I pissed off a big daddy moments, and the wrench for everything else. It might not be realistic to haul that arsenal around in your pockets, but it meant that you had access to a lot of problem-solving elements at once, and you could adjust according to your situation. Now you just kinda pick a combo and hope for the best. It doesn't help that the weapon list is split according to factions, meaning that the founders have one machine gun and the Vox have another. They're basically the same, but upgrades are unique to one specific weapon, not that weapon type. So you can sink all your upgrade points into a specific weapon, and then get to a point in the game where nobody is using it, and you're out of luck. I maxed out the Foundry Carbine because I like semi-automatic mid-range weapons for their versatility. But I got to a point late in the game where all the bad guys were only using the submachine gun, which I hadn't upgraded at all. Needless to say, those were not particularly fun fights. 
You can see that all of these changes are decidedly aimed at positioning Bioshock Infinite amongst the shooter market. And while shooting has gotten one heck of a lot better since the first Bioshock, it's still not a strong enough core foundation to justify how much of it there is. Moving, aiming, and firing the Mauser is definitely a lot smoother than doing so with the Webley, but it's still a little clunky and you're forced into relying on these mechanics constantly because it seems like you're embroiled in a firefight every few minutes. In Bioshock, you could play the security systems of Rapture against each other, hacking a bot or a turret or a camera so that it would work for you and dispatch your enemies. And all considered, there really weren't that many enemies. You usually only fight a few at a time, with big crowds typically being rather prominent set pieces, such as in the battle against Sandra Cohen's Splicer army in Fort Frolic. Now there's a lot more enemies being fought at once, and there's virtually no multifaceted approach to handling them. You just shoot until everybody's dead. Sure, you can use your plasma- um, I'm sorry, vigors, for some variety, but ultimately it's still just you shooting dudes, whether that be with bullets or some kind of poorly explained magic. The only real new thing added to the mix are the skylines, which are actually pretty cool. Ignoring the fact that you'd probably rip your arm out of its socket using these things, they provide some pretty awesome means of traversing a battlefield, whether you speed along at a higher vantage point while firing down on bad guys. Plus, this never gets old. Who's out there? There he is! Get it! Kill. The only downside of the skylines is that they're almost always presented as a circuitous track surrounding a very obvious arena-like area where all you do is shoot dudes. It makes you wonder what kind of dire need the citizens of Columbia had for transporting goods in a small circle, with no obvious means for loading or unloading more. This is another instance of the city becoming kind of theme parky, damaging the idea that this is a real place, and dealing a blow to your immersion. And finally, Bioshock suffers from the same thing that a lot of other shooters do, which is namely just too much damn shooting. Now, a lot of this is probably personal preference. It might be that popping dudes in the head is your favorite means of interacting with a game world, and I guess that's alright. Plenty of games out there that fit the bill for that just fine. But in a game like Bioshock, which is supposedly trying to be about forgiveness, ideological struggles, and a ton of other stuff, the absolutely rampant destruction is kind of off-putting. Again, I'm gonna go to the original Bioshock for reference. The splicers you encountered there were insane, driven mad by excessive tampering with their own cellular structure, to the point that they're less like humans and more like monsters. Shotgunning a splicer in Rapture carried with it about the same level of emotional turmoil as would be present gunning down a rage zombie from 28 days later. These things are long past saving. But in Infinite, that's not the case at all. The people you're shooting are still very much people. Somewhat brainwashed and not particularly pleasant people, but still. All the human elements the game tries to present are largely undermined when those humans don't serve much purpose aside from getting torn apart. It just feels kind of like the game forgets itself whenever it makes you pull out a gun, which is really, really often. At least there's some attempt made to vis-a-vis -vis the forgiveness angle to connect the game's themes with its shooting, namely questioning where salvation can be found for men as destructive as Booker, but it's a little flimsy. Spec Ops, this is not. I don't ask for all my games to cut out their shooty bits, I just want them to make sense and jive with the subject matter of the rest of the game. Booker. Are you afraid of God? No. But I'm afraid of you. So remember at the start of this video when I said that Bioshock Infinite wanted to be about something? Or a lot of somethings? Here's where we get into all that. Bioshock Infinite throws a ton of themes at you. Baptism and forgiveness, American exceptionalism, racism and class discrimination, industrial era exploitation, fatherhood, the role of religion, fatalism, string theory and quantum mechanics, and a bunch of other stuff. This game is dense. Or so it would want you to believe. Instead, what ends up happening is we get a kind of watered-down version of all these ideas, presented to us rapid-fire like someone trying to deliver the entire socio-political spectrum of the Gilded Age in a single 50-minute classroom lecture. Most elements are drastically oversimplified, misrepresented, or just kind of outright wrong, and sometimes you feel like maybe Levine and company would have been better off focusing on just a few of these themes and doing so more thoroughly, instead of giving us the 1912 America Variety Hour, hosted by Paul Mauser. Now, there's actually a very good reason behind all this, and I'm fairly certain that it was all a very deliberate choice on the part of the writers. But I'll expand on that a little bit later. For now, let's take a look at a few of the more prominent conflicts and ideas the game tosses at you, and some of the complaints surrounding them. To start, let's look at the two competing powers in Colombia, the ultra-fundamentalist founders and the anarchic vox populi. 
The first group you run into are the founders, as they constitute the vast majority of upper-class citizens in Colombia. In a lot of ways, they seem like quaint, amiable people. Faith, family, and fatherland. Who could be against all that? Good day, citizen. You're looking fit. My good day to you, sir. Hello. But then you quickly start to realize that something's off. Like, really off. I thought I detected a hint of an accent from our waiter. Hmm. An Oriental stopped me on the street and asked me for the time. Just like that. There should be a law. I think there is. Please, what are you doing? Come on! Are you gonna throw it? Or are you taking your coffee black these days? <laughs> Maybe it's the result of living at nearly 20,000 feet for an extended period of time, but it quickly becomes really apparent that the people of this city are completely enveloped in intense institutionalized racism to the point that almost everything they say seems specifically tailored to color them as completely unlikable bigots. Which, really, it is, and they are. The writers obviously wanted to make it plain that these folks weren't super awesome egalitarian-minded people, but it stops being poignant and start feeling more like parody when damn near every single word, action, and icon is founded on some kind of racism. So now you're thinking, okay, these guys pretty much suck. Maybe it's time to give the Vox Populi a chance running things for a bit. The game even tries to nudge you into this line of thinking by using Elizabeth as a mouthpiece. These people are like this because of Fink? Maybe Daisy's right. Maybe she should pay him back for all of this. Daisy can make a change, can't she? Make things better for the people here. Sure. Booker, if the Vox get their weapons, there's going to be a revolution just like Les Miserables. These people are gonna have better lives. Wait a minute. Just like Les Miserables? Didn't that... Oh. But analogy backfire aside, it is probably due time for a changing of the guard. I mean, hell, they couldn't screw it up any worse, right? Your homes are ours! Your lives are ours! Your wives are ours! It all belongs to the Vox! <laughs> okay, fine, but every group has its fanatics, right? I mean, I'm sure the rest aren't quite as... Wow. Okay, so maybe there's quite a few bad seeds here, but they've obviously got a lot of anger behind them at this point. The part of the movement has to be... Look at this. No! If you want to get rid of the weed, you've got to pull it up from the root! Damn, Bioshock. What we're left with is a scenario in which both sides of this conflict totally suck. Which isn't a problem in and of itself, but it can be when they make this point through the most over-the-top means possible. From the oppressive and racist founders to the murderous anarchistic Vox. Literally no one here is likable, including the protagonist, and the only person in the entire game we can like is Elizabeth. Mind you, they really did a good job with Elizabeth, so that counts for something, but still, you can't really go for an exaggerated, Voltaire-esque satire and still attempt to play it straight. It comes off as ham-fisted. I think part of the problem is actually one of the things I mentioned I was excited about seeing before. All the people. See, while exploring Rapture, you felt equal parts detective and historian. You were uncovering the former lives of all the people that had lived here and putting together the stories that each of them revealed. You were gradually presented with small stitches of the tapestry of Rapture, and when the whole thing was assembled, you got a pretty good idea of what had happened and what had gone wrong. There were tyrants and monsters like Ryan and Suchong, but there were decent people like Tannenbaum and a surprising number of Rapture's everyday population. Mind you, most of them died horribly, but what's important is that you were looking back on a failed idea, like any number of history's fallen governments. You were finding all the pieces, good and bad, and that slowly unfolding mystery is one of the things that kept you playing. In Infinite, we don't need to uncover the problem that made everything go pear-shaped, we're seeing it. And the problem is that everybody's awful. There's no mystery here, the rampant ideological perversion isn't everybody. It's staring you right in the face and it's usually shooting you at the same time. It's a lot more immediate, and that immediacy doesn't really prompt careful examination of what's going on. And then we get to that ending. 
I should point out that I normally don't like time travel alternate universe stuff, with a few notable exceptions, since most of the time writers have a tendency to use it as a get out of jail free card. Bioshock Infinite mostly avoids that by not introducing it as a last minute quick fix solution, but by having it consistently there throughout the narrative, with defined rules in place to restrict its use. This makes it a lot easier for the audience to swallow when the resolution of the story finally comes. Plus, all the terror-induced anachronisms throughout the story give us some pretty awesome musical rearrangements. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no millionaire son. No. It ain't me. It ain't me. I ain't no fortune in one. No. While there's definitely a few gaps, inconsistencies, and kind of cheap narrative tricks going on, it still more or less works. Maybe not scientifically, but it works well enough as part of a story that we can get behind it. It jives with the themes and actions that preempt it, and it's foreshadowed sufficiently that when the reveal comes, it fits into place with all the other pieces that came before it. You might need to turn it around a few times to get all the edges right, but once you find the right angle, then it does fit, at least well enough that you can still be pretty satisfied with the complete picture. Now, I don't want to talk too much here about the time-traveling, universe-hopping, wibbly-wobbly, lighthouse-metaphoring, timey-wimey, ambiguous, demigod creaty stuff. God knows there's enough ending explanation videos out there on YouTube these days, and I don't want to add to all that noise, but first we probably should cover some context. As we learn in literally the last line of dialogue in the game, Booker DeWitt and Zachary Comstock are the same man, existing in separate timelines, the divergence of which was created at the moment of Booker's refusal or acceptance of baptism following the Battle of Wounded Knee. We learn that Bioshock operates according to the Many Worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, which state that all possible outcomes to any given scenario not only can happen, but do happen. As such, there are an infinite... er, wait, I'm sorry, no. There are a million, million worlds. Um, let's just go with a lot of timelines, containing these variations on Booker. One is Booker DeWitt, the man who rejected the baptism and decided that he'd rather face up to the things he'd done and live with them, as opposed to seeking what he views as some kind of escape. Stewing in his own guilt, he walks away and goes on with his life to join the Pinkertons, take up alcoholism, and generally be the worst dad ever. The Booker that becomes Comstock, however, accepts the baptism, and having totally missed the point, ceases to feel guilt or even the slightest inkling of conscience about anything. He then goes on to brand himself a prophet, found Columbia, lead a secessionist movement away from the United States, and generally be the worst person ever. The baptism plays off the spiritual rebirth it's meant to symbolize, and results in these two drastically different men. And due to the Lutesta's terror-manipulating experiments, all these Comstocks will continually interfere in the lives of all the Bookers to acquire an heir to his legacy, resulting in the world-ending Elizabeth. The only way to defeat Comstock is for Booker to go back to this divergence point and allow himself to be killed, eradicating any possibility for Comstock ever to exist. As I said, there's issues here as to whether this solution would actually resolve the problem, and it seems to play fast and loose with its own definition of constants and variables, insofar as we're never actually given a definition. It seems to discount all the myriad of possibilities that could come out of this scenario, like Comstock actually becoming a strong believer, Booker finding more healthy ways of dealing with his guilt, or even the possibility that it never happened at all. Booker could stay home that day and not go to the revival, or the seventh calf could have been a little less jumpy when dealing with Black Coyote and avoided the massacre entirely. But instead the game implies, or at the very least solely focuses on these two defined outcomes being the only ones that matter. But at least for me, the problems aren't big enough and don't compound enough to break my enjoyment of the narrative. It's still a pretty good story, and I can deal with a few gaps or leaps of logic here and there more readily just because the game has endeared itself to me pretty well at this point. But, like I said, I don't want to talk about all that too much, I just want to talk about this thematically. Now, it would be really easy to initially interpret this as a kind of take that towards the Christian faith. The guy who accepts the baptism goes on to become a tyrannical bastard who tries to destroy the world. It seems pretty cut and dry, right? Well, no, not really. See, while Comstock accepts the baptism, he completely and utterly fails to grasp any of the core concepts of Christianity, and steadfastly refuses to follow any of Christ's teachings. He sees the baptism and the promise of forgiveness as giving him a blank check to do whatever he wants without consequence. The Lord forgives everything, and I'm just a prophet, so I don't have to. He's reborn alright, but as a man who holds himself accountable to nothing, who's convinced himself that if his past sins are stricken away, then his future sins must not hold any weight either. 
This is most definitely not what Christianity is about. Needless to say, neither is literally deifying the Founding Fathers, setting yourself up as a figure of worship, and killing everyone who disagrees with you. Comstock remains some of the trappings of Christianity, but it's about as far removed from the teachings of Christ as it's possible to be. And so here I come to my point, and I'm actually going to steal my own thunder and let Ken Levine explain it himself, as I think hearing it from the guy who helped create the game gives the idea a little bit more legitimacy. It's not, it's not a game that's saying, we don't, the game doesn't have any sort of commentary about like the existence of God or anything, it's about how man deals with religion, and what man, you know, you know and how mortals deal with religion. Notice the distinction that he makes there. Religion as man handles it, not necessarily as it is. Comstock's twisted interpretation of Christianity is essentially a result of the same perversions that afflict the patriotism and class equality movements of the Founders and the Vox, respectively. Moreover, it's the same problem that sunk Rapture in the first game, no pun intended. In short, I guess what I'm trying to get at with all of this is that the consistent theme of the Bioshock franchise across all of its iterations is this. The destruction of ideology when misappropriated by extremism. Andrew Ryan's tyrannical grip on Rapture poisoned the idea of objectivism. Sophia Lamb's similar selfish control of her daughter for her own gains, long past the point of usefulness, poisoned the idea of utilitarianism. And Zachary Comstock's refusal to show personal repentance poisoned the idea of Christianity. Levine and company recognize that an idea, no matter how pure its foundations, can and often will be corrupted by people, even or perhaps especially by those with well-intentioned motives. Finally, I want to talk about one more major theme of the game that wasn't mentioned in any pre-launch interviews for obvious reasons. Namely, it would have been a huge spoiler, but it's one that going back and playing through the game a second time really struck me with how deeply yet subtly it was explored. It's present and prominent throughout, and it's perhaps the only theme that isn't grounded in a fatalistic interpretation. It actually contains a lot of hope and various warm fuzzy feelings, and that's one reason why I saved it for last. I'm talking here about the theme of parenthood. Now, I'm not a dad, and I don't have plans to become one anytime soon, but that's apparently not a prerequisite for making this part of the story really stick out to me. For whatever reason, stories about parenthood seem to have some kind of innate ability to really resonate with most audiences. Ellen Ripley looking after Newt, Sarah Connor struggling to raise John Connor, Jean Valjean adopting a young Cosette. These are some powerful stories, and they're a pretty surefire way to strike at an audience's emotional core, provided they're fleshed out correctly. And in Bioshock Infinite, the relationship between Booker and Elizabeth is definitely fleshed out correctly. And looking back across the whole game with the lens of hindsight, it's probably the best father-daughter relationship ever portrayed in a video game. And I'll even go so far as to say that it gives that dynamic and other mediums a run for its money. It's one of the many reasons why Elizabeth has now dethroned Alex Vance as one of my favorite NPC companions ever written. The connection is just that much stronger. But don't just take my word for it, here's a few parallels I picked up on while playing through the game again. So right off the bat, the game works really, really hard to endear the character of Elizabeth to the player. The first time we see her, it's completely candid. She doesn't know we're there, and we're able to see a little bit of how she behaves on her own, all via non-dialogue sequences. Notice that despite being about 19 or 20 at this point, her movements are deliberately overly youthful, justified as her having had virtually no human social contact her whole life, but also give her the impression of being a young girl, still reliant on others, like, oh, say, her father? Yet despite that, your first actual interaction with her paints her as being capable. What's the first thing she does when you drop in on her in the library? Uh, hello. <laughs> Okay, well, yes, but that's fair, we just fell out of the damn ceiling. What's the second thing she does? Uh, hey! Knock it off! Stop it! Will you stop it? Yeah, she starts pelting you with books. She's young and kind of naive, sure, but she's not going to take anybody's crap, either. Notice that this display of strength is also the first time we get a close-up shot of Elizabeth. We've seen her, but now we're meeting her, and this face-to-face -face confrontation sets her up as a competent individual, one who quite literally fights with knowledge, given that her weapon of choice is a book about quantum physics. After the songbird attack on the tower, we end up in a kind of theme park, and seemingly not bothered by a fall that probably should have been fatal, one of the first things Elizabeth does with her newfound freedom is she joins in a dance circle. First of all, this reminded me a lot of this scene from Firefly, where River is seen actually cutting loose and having fun after a brutal imprisonment. Like River, Elizabeth is displaying her youthful innocence through the act of dance, which is a classical means of emotional expression. And the emotion being expressed here is one of very simple, unrestrained happiness. Show of hands, who just let her dance for a while because you knew that the sooner you left, you'd probably be dragging her into more trouble, and you just wanted to let her enjoy the moment of peace. 
I did, that's for sure. Next, we see her overjoyed by the notion that she can go to Paris and get away from the place she's been confined to her whole life. Let's go! Come on, let's go! Come on, let's go right now! Look how freaking happy she is. That's the face of a kid who's just been told that she gets to go to Disneyland. By this point, the player's totally sold. We like this girl, we're invested in her story, and we want to do what we can to look out for her. The game has officially laid on you the same vested interest as you would have were you actually her father. This is good. Pretty soon, though, things do go sour, and the player is introduced to some of the hard parts of being a dad. After you're attacked and you fight off the assailants, Elizabeth turns and outright flees from you. This serves two purposes. One, it shows that sense of bitter disappointment that young children can sometimes get when they realize their parents aren't as perfect as they thought them to be. Booker isn't just some valiant rescuer, he's also a violent, almost merciless killer. And two, it also serves as a learning experience for Elizabeth. Yeah, Booker's a killer, but the people he killed also would have taken Elizabeth back to a life of imprisonment. This is her first real exposure to the fact that the world is not a kind place, and can't always be dealt with kindly. Then when you get her onto the airship, she finds out that you lied to her. She's not going to Paris, she's going to New York to settle a debt. And she responds like anyone would. Come on, Eddie. Oh, you damn brute. Look what you did! You told the kid she was going to Disneyland, but instead you're taking her to a boarding school in New Jersey. The game really does make you feel like crap here, because this is the second time you've let her down. Of course, then it also introduces you to the next step in the parenting process. Everything's gonna be okay. Will you just turn around and talk to me and we can- <laughs> Those teenage rebellious years. From here, you have to contend with Elizabeth coming into her own. At first, you don't want her to use her abilities. But over time, you realize that she's actually pretty useful and can be a real help. You gotta let go of those reservations and let her try things for herself. Letting her start opening tears is the equivalent of handing her the car keys. Yeah, she might crash it, but she's gotta learn sometime. You've also got the continuing songbird threat, which I saw as the equivalent of every father's worst fear. Your little girl getting into an unhealthy relationship. Think about it. Songbird's a violent menace wholly dedicated to keeping Elizabeth confined and locked away from the rest of the world, repeatedly coming to blows with you yourself over this conflict. I think any dads watching this can probably agree that this is an absolute nightmare thought. But finally, at the climax of the game, after all the two of you have been through, Elizabeth finally has to grow up. When the siphon's destroyed, Elizabeth gains total control over the entirety of her power. She can do things now that she never could before, new and powerful things. Also notice that she becomes a lot more distant during this final exposition dump, with virtually none of her previous youthful exuberance. This is adult Elizabeth, and she's not quite the same little girl you spent the entire game raising, so to speak. And if you think that's sad, by the time the game ends, Elizabeth will have never existed. She's wiped away, and all that growth is undone to prevent any of the horrors of the game from ever taking place. This might seem really incredibly depressing, but remember, Elizabeth started life as Anna DeWitt, Booker's daughter. And the final scene of the game seems to suggest that after all is said and done, the two of them are back together without Comstock to interfere. To me, that means that Booker now has the chance to raise his daughter for real. You get to actually be a father to her this time, and that's a happy ending as far as I'm concerned. So, now that I've rambled on for... Whoa... Okay, yeah, it's probably about time to wrap this up. I said at the start of this video that you couldn't help but judge this game based not just on what was there, but also on what wasn't. That might sound like it lays the groundwork for a more critical interpretation, but really I think it works just as well as the opposite. I saw a lot of things in Bioshock Infinite, but what I think I saw most of all was potential. Some of it was realized, some of it wasn't, but I've got to respect it for trying. It seems like not enough games these days use their medium to try and explore ideas in the way that Bioshock aspires to, and while it trips over a hurdle or two along the way, what it tries to be ends up being just as important to me as what it is. I'm Gildan Stern from NerdWatchShow.com, and this has been Talking Points. Thanks for watching. It's my own design. It's my own remorse. Help me to decide. Help me make the most of freedom and of pleasure. Nothing can ever last forever.